Okay, we will start. I hope everybody do, is doing well on this Tuesday. Good to see everybody here. And we have a very, very, very special guest with us today. Mr. David Sun. Everybody knows him. He needs no introduction. He is the owner and operator of the Trade Busters, both podcast and name. So, David, thank you so much for joining us. You were one of the first people we asked to do this, and you're a busy man. So I appreciate you taking time with, for us today. Yeah, no problem. Glad we could finally find some time. Yeah, for sure. So you, I was telling him this morning, he, David's been on like a million podcasts. Everybody, if you listen to any options podcast, you have heard David just because everybody wants to talk to him. But. Uh, I'm going to ask some general questions, and then we're going to just dive in. Because it's Option Omega, we're going to probably get a little bit deeper, hopefully, than and some surface stuff. So, but to start with surface stuff, David Sun, who the heck are you? So, um, I'm just a, an, another one of a million engineers that somehow liked options because I guess engineers just have that kind of analytical mindset. So I'm, I'm still a practicing engineer, but as you may or may not have seen when I, you know, for example, first went on Tasty Trade, Rising Star, it was options trading since around 2008, 2009, but that was mostly, you know, just DIY. I don't really know. There's probably resources back then, but it's not like I really read books or watched anything. Um, it was just a buddy that taught me initially and then kind of just bumped along blindly until around 2017 when a buddy introduced me to Tasty Trade, And that was like a whole, you know, another level of content and just consumed all of that was knee deep in that, doing all of their strategies, trying different things, um, probably about a year and a half, you know, and, and that was like the really big acceleration for the learning curve. And uh, people may or may not know, I, I'd launched, you know, my first options based hedge fund late 2018 started a podcast at some point, you know, because I was interacting with a lot of people on the Facebook groups, Tasty Trade groups, uh, started posting my stuff, started doing my trading page, posting strategies, did my podcast, uh, started a second hedge fund in 2021. And so now at this point, the podcast has been around for a while. It's, it, was, it was interesting because it was like <laughs> around Black Friday when I started my own Discord group. So there's like just so many things going on. Um, and they were all kind of like things I just wanted to share and give back to the you know people I've been corresponding with. And so right now I've got the hedge funds, I've got the podcast, the Discord group, and yeah, and here we are 2023. So it's been a whirlwind. Um, but high level, that's just kind of all of the stuff that I've been doing all kind of jumbled together. But um, yeah. Like, and, and for sure, you, you know, I think in some ways, like people really started getting to know you via Rising Star, Tasty Trade. Before you were doing that, did you ever play with long options? I mean, obviously, David Sun is known for selling options. That's what you're known for. But did, did you play around with the, the flip side of it at all? It's interesting because, no, I didn't. Because when my buddy taught me, he taught me from the selling side. And I don't know if, that's just how he got into it or if he'd play with the long side. But um, actually, I, I should say I tried. He taught me from the selling side, but I thought I was smart. And I did try buying a long at the money straddle for Apple earnings and then immediately <laughs> lost a bunch of money when, <laughs> you know. And so after that, no, I didn't really do anything from the long. I was like, you know what? The selling side just... And this was naive at the beginning, but it just seemed easier, you know, collect the credit, roll it, whatever. And a lot of dumb luck for the first couple of years. Um, obviously, after 08 happened, the market just went up for a number of years. So yeah. there was no lessons learned for like a year <laughs> and a half, two years. Yeah. No, those are those are always like, when you look back, you realize that. But during the time, you're it's very difficult to not be like, I've cracked the code. I am an options genius. It is what it is. Uh, so how did you get, I know you've probably answered this before, but how did you get involved with Tasty Trade and then eventually talking to Tom and Tony? So 
there was another friend at work that he was trying to find he knew i was an option so that talk about it you know at the office and stuff and and he was looking around he was looking for other ideas and how to invest his money he found tasty trade and uh it's funny because he started bugging me to like watch he was like hey i found this thing and like you know it's like a weird name I, and i was blowing him off for like it's funny because we look back and like it was like two weeks and i was like what is that he was like don't you want to like have new ideas or find some interesting stuff and like stimulate your mind and you know and like you said when somebody kind of thinks they know something they, everything else seems like kind of not interesting so i was like yeah whatever you know but then he, he kept bugging he kept showing me videos and finally he showed me like a segment of um calling tom and tony and like they're talking about you know, rolling before earnings or sorry, rolling before like the ex dividend date because there's dividend risk. And that was like kind of interesting. And then talking about the whole 45 to 21 DTE. So finally I took a listen and, you know, it doesn't take much. Like if, you, if you're even mildly into options, you, you t take a couple of listens and you just fall right in. So that was, like I said, like summer 2017. And, you know, from that point, it was the usual watch it all day try different trades you know and you're putting on like dozens of trades and following along i called in so many times um during that year and a half and what i found out somebody it was a friend that actually suggested the the rising stars because it, there's not like a formal process per se and it it's i think maybe some people they do reach out to directly as far as getting them on a guest but i actually reached out and um it's jules weinstein that runs the rising star. I don't know if he still does it, but you eventually just you essentially just email him like, hey, you know, I'm interested in coming on. And he of course will respond and he'll, you know, he'll do a call, he'll a couple emails. Like they know, you can tell who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. hundred percent. That know like sometimes people will reach out and, and he'll be like, you know, you're not quite ready or whatever. And that's what that what I've heard anyway. So we went back and forth. Um eventually he was like, yeah, you know, might be a good fit. Uh I had a pre-call with Tom, set a date, and flew in. I flew in and out that that same day. I was the, I was in Chicago for all of like six hours or something. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Immediately after that segment, I was, you know, Ubering back to the airport and going back home. But that, yeah, it was crazy great. to think that. That was that was November twenty nineteen. Yeah, so like like barely two years since yeah, that's... finding them. That's wild. And that in some ways like speaks to the to the journey you've been on, because were you on Rising Star before, you know, I first started interacting with you in the Tasty Che group on Facebook, which I know a lot of people here come from or are a part of. Um, was that kind of synonymous with that time you were on there or was it which which one came first? I guess if you remember the date. I can't tell, but. Sure. Rising Star was November 2019. So before that is before the appearance and after that and so forth. So if you if you can if you somehow find an old DM or something, yeah, you can pinpoint the date. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to law and order you. I, I trust you with it. But uh, but I, we definitely, I'd been on. Obviously, I'd been in the Facebook groups from before I went on because it was just like as soon as I first found Tasty Trade, I was like just searching for Facebook. Like, are there groups or whatever um and th there was there's so there's two of them if people know there's like the original i don't know if it's still they, they changed it to like tasty trade and beyond and then there's the one that probably most people in here know about tasty trade options that was the second group that sprung up there was a lot of it's funny there's so much drama in these options groups. oh my gosh there was, there was a guy who ran the first one and people didn't like him somebody went off and started the tasty trade options and that one's like a few thousand people so i was in the first one i joined the second one so I was in that. I mean, I'm not in there anymore, but it was a good, wow, like three years solid that I was in there. Yeah, I mean, that's the amount of drama in an options group is amazing to me. Like the stuff that you see every day in there and it, it ebbs and flows and there's always like flavors of the month and things like that. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me about you is you're in this weird space where you are an educator and you know, you, you do teach and you're very thorough. Like I, I love your podcast just because half the time you almost have to listen to your podcast with a spreadsheet open. 
which is fun to me that, you know, you, you were very thorough with it. What is the, but you also run a hedge fund and I, I have seen and have interacted with you and have watched you enough to know that you get a lot of stupid questions about what you can share or not share that a lot of people don't realize that with a hedge fund, you literally can't share your strategy unless they're an accredited investor. Yeah, we can't market, right? And what is marketing, right? Talking about performance, talking about strategy. I don't right. really even give the name of the fund. I mean, if people are going to approach me in private, that's whatever. But like, yeah, I have to be careful about what I say, especially on, on podcasts or just in general. Because there's kind of two, so private, hedge funds, are, they're private offerings. And there's two ways, two pathways, which you can get investors as a, what's called an exempt advisor. We're not a registered investment advisor. Right. So if you want to have the ability to generally and it's just for anyone that's interested, if you want to you know, go into this space. Right. If you want to be able to generally solicit, talk about performance, you know, and market the fund in public, it's under what's called Reg D 506 C. And it means that you not only can only take accredited or qualified investors, but you have to actually do your own due diligence and make efforts to verify, check their tax statements, whatever, income, all that. And then the other pathway is called Reg D 506B. And it means that you still can only take accredited investors and so on and so forth, but there's an investor questionnaire, which you give people and they, they essentially self-certify, which, you know, AK check the box or whatever. And yeah. that's the requirement. Um, but it, it bars raising capital to, uh, I think the term is uh, somebody you have a, a substantive relationship with which it doesn't mean it has to be like someone you've known all your life. You have to have, you know, spoken, you know, in person or in pri um, virtually, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you've, you've taken some efforts to understand what they're looking for and, and their situation. And so it's not just some, you know, Joe Schmo off the street. Um, yeah. And it's not something that just heard you off of a podcast, for example, you know? Yeah, no, that it's funny to me because I, like on the one hand, People are like, hey, you talk about strategy all day long, but you won't get into specifics. And your answer is like, I run a hedge fund. I'm not allowed to. And I've always been intrigued by like their response because on the one hand, like, okay, I can understand some confusion because you do talk about strategy. You just don't talk about performance, right? And let me clarify a little bit. That's true what you just said, but actually, okay. and again, I don't talk about this specifically because of all the things I just said, but Sure. The strategies we do in our funds, and especially in one of them, is you know all proprietary stuff. I don't yeah. share the strategies. It's not stuff in my podcast, and the stuff I do in the podcast, I take you know care to say that hey, I'm just providing tools. Right? Here's a strategy. Here's a strategy. Here's a strategy. Now, if you happen to run strategy A, B, C in the exact mix, I happen to run it in my fund you'll have my performance, you'll know whatever. But I don't say that, right? I just say, hey, yes, these are strategies I use, but like, how much do you make from a strategy? Well, it depends how you size it, right? There's a lot of things that go into that. So I can say, I'm, I'm educating. These are just things I'm providing. Yeah. You do with it what you want. Yeah. But, what, but does that make you able to have my performance? No, not necessarily. Nor does it even tell you what my performance is. So as long as I kind of, delineate those things and have a very clear mo of like hey the podcast is like educational right it's mm -hmm. outreach i'm not even talking about my fund or you know i, I mentioned that and occasionally if it's in context but 90 percent of the podcast stuff you're not going to hear the word hedge fund right you're just going to say right. hey let's, let's talk about the strategy today you know yeah no and that's a great reminder that uh my other one of my other partners matt always uh, is right to beat me up for because I forget until we're halfway through this, but options involve risks. They're not suitable for all investors. Uh, the option omega is backward looking, not forward looking. And nothing David or I are talking about is to be construed as financial advice. As always, consult with your financial advisor because this is for entertainment purposes only. So with that being said, thank you. I, yeah, that to me feels, one of the people I kind of got into options via Nassim Taleb which is doing the exact opposite of what you're doing in some ways. But but he 
him and Mark Spitznagel, uh, the Universa Fund and things like that, there's a book Mark Spitznagel just came out with um, a couple of years ago called Safe Haven, I think. And he talks an overall strategy, you know, an overall view of options or a view of the market. But and and the follow up people always have is like, yeah, but like what strikes are you buying? They're like, well, that's his business. <laughs> and then same way, like with you, it's like people want to get so I think it's the Internet age. I don't know what it is, but people want to get so uh, drilled down in the specifics of like what exactly you're doing. And I've always found it interesting, like I said, just because you're very generous. Like the flip side of it is like you're you're you are educating a lot for someone who runs a hedge fund. And so I've always been thankful for you for that, because you really do go out of your way to kind of explain options and concepts and things like that. And like you're saying, you're not giving the specifics uh, of what you're doing, but obviously, like you're teaching things that you're that you have conviction in. And so I just have never understood it, but I appreciate what you do. With it. So sure. um so I know last year was crazy. You know, selling premium last year was insane. Uh, but I had this sneak, and I haven't talked to you in a couple of months, but I had this sneaking suspicion that the last six months of the year, I thought, man, the trade buster model, like if there is such a thing as a trade buster model, but that idea of premium capture, um, in some ways it felt like it was maybe proving itself the last six months. But that was just me looking from the outside. Can you speak to, you know, last year, just any learned lessons, how the strategy held up, all those things? Yeah. And actually, um, I know we talked about if you want to do a sh screen share, um, yeah. you want to do that now? We can. Yeah, uh, please I, do. I, I had something. Let me uh, make sure I have this set up where, uh, okay, let me just pull up the page that I wanted. Give me one second and I'll share. Sure thing. And everybody say hi to David. I forgot to say that in the chat. And then uh, and then I'm going to mute and let him take over. I'm going to look forward to this. Hi. All right. Let me go ahead. Share this. OK, uh, I know you're can you let me know real quick if you can see? It's just a Google Sheet. Yeah, I can see it. Can everybody see okay. it? Okay, cool. So for anyone that follows me, this page will be very familiar. For those that don't, this is the Google Sheets page that's all publicly available for one of my strategies, which is you know the Theta Engine, which is the 90 DTE put selling strategy. And if we look at the graph itself, I think so. This is similar to what you'll see even in an optional mega output. This is the closed trade equity curve. This is not daily mark to market, but um, this one I have it running from like late 2020 through you know present day. And yeah, 2022 is right here. So not one of the years that was good for the strategy, but you can see like right around after the end of October, it's just been on a tear. Um, and I think we're I don't know what's going to happen in the next month, but I keep saying, you know, we're, we're possibly one month out from basically breaking even and getting back to all time highs. And that's saying something because SPX is kind of still, I don't know, it's like 15% off the all time highs and who knows how long that's going to take. So to what you're saying before is it's kind of a testament, testament to not just my strategy, but premium selling in general, because the idea with this strategy is when you use good risk management, right? You're not going to have those big blowouts. Um, in a year like 2021, where the market just goes up, yeah, depending on the sizing, you're not necessarily going to keep up or make as much as the market. But And so sometimes people lose sight of that, right? And But the point is like when the market, and last year, everything really went haywire. And uh, these dips here, we call these, I call them book wipes. Book wipes is when you have like, you know, a full book of positions, you know, 10, 15 positions, and then all of them get stopped out. So you, you can see very clearly, you know, the, and yes, of course, this is generally correlated with the market, but depending on your sizing, like, you know, the market might have a leg down and we were close, you know, similar size drawdown. But then once the second and third wave came, yes, we still lost, but because of the stops, like you, you can tell <laughs> everything gets stopped out. And, and people say, 
you know, the idea of like rolling and trying to hang on for dear life and hoping the market comes back. This is exactly why I don't roll, so to speak, right? This is like a reset, right? Because you want to dodge that huge down leg. And then finally, everything kind of turned around and I'm probably 18, 19 trades from getting back to, to break even. So um, this is, I have much longer back test and you can run the, um, I should have saved one. It, uh, I'll send a template or something, but if you run the strategy in Option Omega, it is beautiful. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> really nice looking and in practice because this this was a live trade log so it, it, this is not back tested data right and i have it going back where it's right around mm -hmm. um 18 percent premium capture now the back test shows more like 27 but i don't it depending on how much slippage you bake in um and of course this includes one down year right in the middle where it was negative capture that year but like the years around it were really good so yeah, it's one of those things where if you follow the mechanics and like, you know, don't size too big and blow up, like it, it will come back. And, and I think that just goes to show like that whole nature of like, uh, you know, people talk about seller's edge or premium selling, having that positive expectancy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be positive every year for sure. All right. This is I mean, right there. You can see that negative year, but like, yeah, it's, 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 it's been good. <laughs> I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm going to have a, uh, a post for sure if, if we hit of like hit break even finally and uh, and, and i know once that happens like probably we'll have a leg down and we'll have losses again but again <laughs> if i can break even you know when the market might be a year and a half two years from breaking you know like i, I think that's doing its job basically well no i agree completely and like you said it is a testament to the strategy and it's a it's a use that I, I appreciate how you think through it because it's a use of options in a way that people don't who are new to options or don't understand options don't realize because in effect what your strategy is doing is trading it's a trade-off for a little bit you're losing a little bit of delta like market delta like you were saying like on those years where it just grinds higher all year the return might not be uh one to one but what you're trading off for that is positive theta where markets like the last six months or last eight months where we really just haven't done anything. Exactly. You were, when it just you were, goes down and grinds, that's you're right. still cranking out that's right. all profits. You're, yeah. And so you're really, I mean, for, for a Greeks, you know, for someone who understands Greeks, I mean, it's, it's, I like thinking through it in the Greeks and what your strategy is do is, is you're trading Delta for theta. You're, you're using theta to your advantage at, and not necessarily too much to the expense of Delta, because like you're saying, like, uh, you, you, it's not like you're going to have a down year when the markets is grinding up. It's just you might not correlate exactly to the S&P uh, when you do that. Now, that's that's the theta engine strategy. Are you, I know you run a couple different things, and I know, again, like you can't get to the specifics of it, but are you still interacting with like zero day options and things like that? I am. So okay. the, the zero day stuff, that's we have one fund that's exclusive zero DTE, but that's also the one that's like automated and pretty sophisticated. So that side of it, I basically don't really touch it at all in my podcast. The podcast is just about data engine. We've got the new, the short one or three DTE strangle, the ERN strangle. Um, and then a lot of stuff about portfolio construction. There's different uh, Google Sheets tools that I've built, different spreadsheets, and that's what it's all kind of the, the podcast I focus is on that. Yeah, but yeah, I, I am doing zero DTE as well. That makes sense. So you're you've more or less worked towards automation of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Uh, I know you know at a certain point with the Fed engine, last year was interesting because you you had different. Um, oh, and forgive me, I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but you had different hedges in place. Can you, can oh. you tell me, the, yeah, the name of those hedges again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so the bomb shelter, that that's is right. a pure black swan hedge, and that's almost like a combo trade. For every position I enter of the, sh you know, the short put on Theta Engine, there, it's basically a back ratio, and it's calendarized, meaning Theta Engine's sitting around 90 DTE. Mm -hmm. The two long puts are 60 DTE, because the shorter duration lets you get closer to the money, mm -hmm. and... I, since I'm only in Theta Engine for about average 26 days, it's a 90 DT trade, but on average you're in it for 26 days. When yeah. that comes off, either via a stop or a 
profit take, I also take off that portion of the bomb shelter. So it's kind of one for one. So each short is paired with two longs. And that's a pure black swan hedge in so far as, you know, there's some confusion sometimes because especially last year, people were like, why didn't this do anything? It didn't really hedge any losses. And in fact, sometimes it lost money. But that's not the point. And I go into it in the podcast, for instance, like this is for like if there is that crazy gap, you know, some kind of, you know, nuclear bomb, you know, 20 percent overnight, then it'll kick in because that's a Vega hedge. Right. But uh, especially last year with the grind down, that's not expected to do anything. And it pretty much did what I thought it would do, which is, you know, just cost a little bit. But that's more like an insurance policy. Yeah. Honestly, I never want to see a situation where. I need that black swan hedge or the bomb shelter to do because that means the bomb happened, right? That's right. So, so, so that's the one thing. And then the other one, and it's funny because I make these goofy names, it's the vibranium shield, but really it's just rolling 90 DTE teenies uh, at about one and a half delta. And the reason I call it vibranium shield is because most of the time it does nothing. <laughs> the delta is so low, but occasionally in like a 2020 event, maybe like a 2018, 2019, that's when it pays off. You have those multiple standard deviation moves. And the vibranium shield concept is, you know, the vibranium, and like, it absorbs energy <laughs> until all of a sudden it releases it. So, you know, I just, I think of these things just to, it's like easier to like connect the concepts and stuff. Um, and, yeah. you know, that, that again, they don't really do, people have, there's so many podcasts that I listen to where like, you know, there's whole tail hedge funds that like went out of business last year because, <laughs> We had the 20% drawdown, 25% drawdown. Vol just didn't work. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, maybe because after COVID, people were hedged already and this time they didn't do it. So there's like a bunch of different theories. But needless to say, I'm not really surprised and I don't really expect this kind of tail hedge to necessarily give that huge payoff for, right? Because there was like a reset after COVID, you know? So, you know. No, that's that makes complete sense. That in a year where I mean, last year in a year where you more or less in January could have sold equities and sold vol, like a tell hedge is not going to pay off. That's not that how tell hedges work, you know. And so to be short Vega and short Delta uh, is not normally the recipe for a, a hedge. And so having traded last year and now having the data, I was interested just because you are an, a Greek guy. What, do you have any thoughts about like how you would hedge use you know with theta engine a market that happened last year like a short vol short delta market is there any other type of hedge that is even possible yes but again that's if you knew that that's what's going to happen because last year um funds that did well that were long vol were not tail hedged they were just long vol and they monetize so if you're doing these higher delta shorter duration but just buying puts and kind of trading into them, uh, you can get, you know, a quick 200%, 300% profit and scalp out of it, right? But you're not trying to buy a teeny and make 2000%, right? So if you knew, and nobody knows, but uh, if you knew and you expect these kind of like quick downs and then like a reversal and then without the tails lifting, then yeah, you just buy closer to the money and you're almost doing like a directional bet. But you know, I'm not really in the business of like trying to predict those kind of directions. And so like the things I do, and I always say like they're designed for a very specific purpose and there's a, a reason why I do it. And I'm not saying it's going to cover all the bases, but like this is what I want it to do. And if it happens, it does. If it doesn't, you know, it's just part of the plan anyways. Mm -hmm. And with the bomb, so with the bomb shelter, uh, you are, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, a multiple standard deviation move that benefits from that. So it's almost one of the way I look at those, it's almost like these little gamma bombs that like expand with gamma. And, and obviously they're, they're long uh, Vega too. Um, but, but you don't really get that Vega benefit until there's a little bit of like gamma expansion with the Is vibranium. That, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was going to say going. there has to be some kind of like shock to the, like, if the market, like people, if they're hedged and they don't, they're not freaking out, right? IV is not going to go through the roof, right? So there's a lot of things in the world that, you know, maybe are different now than like pre-COVID. Um, and so it, that, that's why things just didn't 
go the way that people expected it to. Yeah. Were you running anything close to um, Theta Engine during uh, Vomageddon of 2018? Like, were you trading on that day anything close to the strategy that you're running? No, back then, because Vomageddon was, uh, so I'll say that was about a it's year. Like, I, I was trading pretty basic stuff. I was doing like 70 T puts. Okay. I don't, I don't even think I was using stops. Honestly, I was like doing yeah. profit take and no stops. And yeah, it was, 2018 was not good. Um, yeah. Learned a lot of lessons. I mean, thankfully it was not like margin call level of like bad, but it was like, Hey, like they don't always work out. You gotta be more careful, you know? So <laughs> like slap on the wrist. So that, it was, it was, it was really good to have 2018 happen before 2020. Let's put it that way. Oh man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it was a lot of little learning lessons before the big one. Uh, yeah, I was just interested because stops, I almost think in that weird type of one-off thing, like stops, I know this is controversial. I don't know if they would have helped or not. Like that day, that specific day that VIX went up, you know, 100% in a day. Um, but I, I don't know. And so I was interested to know if, if anybody, I know if people got stopped out if they had stops. I know that. You know, if you do the test, it doesn't look that bad. The only thing that obviously we can't go back and know now is like the execution because that day, you know, VIX went up a lot intraday. I don't remember how much it had gapped up from the day before. But remember, there's also this thing of like, you know, if you're trading as long as you don't have a huge size or like just trying to target a large return in general where you have like having one bad slippage or one bad fill mm -hmm. out of the hundreds of trades, thousands of trades. I mean, it's, it's okay, right? Like yeah. things happen. Um, yeah. And that's why I always stress like having like a mix of strategies. Seven DTE probably would have been blown out of the water. But the nice mm -hmm. thing about the 90 DTE, it's actually quite a bit more resilient than you would think. Um, hmm. The gamma is lower for one. And uh, there's something called weighted Vega where the, the true impact of Vega is actually, it goes to the, the, the square root of like the days and uh, the DTE. So it's actually a little muted, a little bit more muted than you would think. It's not necessarily the case that long DTE means it's super Vega sensitive. It's actually almost mm -hmm. the inverse. So that, that's one thing I'll add. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So you, you have had a busy three years and you've done a bunch of stuff in the last three years. So what does this year look like for you? Are, are you, are you kind of continuing to hone what you do or you're adding, are you always looking to add more strategies or do you, are you kind of like, no, I just need to like refine the one I have. We're, we're looking to refine. We're always like going different. You know, what's funny because some of the strategies we've built or added, it's not stuff that we would have just sat down and come up with. What happens is a lot of incremental ideas and improvement. I think that's why having stuff like optional mega and just really good robust testing, because like you'll, you'll, you'll trade a strategy like the one you're already trading. And then based on what the market does, you're like, Oh, this didn't really work that well, but Hey, I wonder if I can try something a little different because, Oh, now I know that the market can do this. Then you can go test that idea, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, what, what if this happens? And so it's almost like things happen in response to something that already occurred that mm -hmm. spawns a new idea. So that's mm -hmm. always going on. And then on the side of it, you know, the podcast, you know, I can't believe I just put out the 82nd episode today. It's that was crazy. a rebroadcast of, a, of, my, of another guest appearance I had. But, you know, um, you know, we were talking earlier today, like I actually want to do a mini series on back testing, I'm going to call it back testing best practices, because I think with the proliferation of and the advancement of optional mega, because you guys just add, you know, every feature under the sun, which is great. But sometimes there can be, it's like hard to know how to properly test, you know, and um, I think it was Rusty that said it, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? Like you can have the best tool, but if you're not setting it up right, you're going to get results that don't line up with real world trading yeah. especially with longer day long time frame tests like multi year because yeah. sizing needs to be consistent and compounding 
And, you know, if you're just trying to churn out 1000 Kager strategies, you're not going to have that kind of result. So I want to do like some episodes and, and they may not all come out at once or in, in this order, but like very laser focused um, and kind of very topic, topical or topic specific, like how to deal with slippage, right? how to deal with commissions, like really micro and like maybe do like five to t- no more than 10 minutes. And then uh, the other idea I had was, um, so uh, as you mentioned, sometimes listening to my episodes, it's, you got to follow on the spreadsheet, right? And at, at, when it, when that happens, I'll mention in the episode, like, hey, go to this page, follow this. But I almost want to do where for each episode, I'm going to build a separate sheet that's like a companion sheet for that episode specifically, almost set up like an exercise so you can actually go along and like do whatever thing i'm teaching because i want to teach them like spreadsheet hacks as well um because what i do is sometimes i'll take output from optional mega right and i'll paste it into a spreadsheet but i can do my own massage and get the specific kind of like studies you know and you guys of course have added tons of metrics but sometimes there's stuff like i want to see and it's just easier to like build your own thing. So I think it would be kind of cool to like have these like episodes and have like, you know, very, it's almost like download this spreadsheet, follow along. It's almost like, like a tutorial kind of, you know, so that's kind of what I have in mind. Um, no, I, lo- I love that. And I look forward, I look forward to listening to it and probably sharing it because one of the things that we've, you know, noticed over the last year, I think actually tomorrow's our one year anniversary. Uh, nice. And so yeah. I appreciate it. You were, you were one of the, the the first ogs that we reached out to so but one of the things doing this a year is people i've actually it's it's changed how i've looked at back testing because one of the things that we you know we started with a back tester you know using it for our own training and uh the results were like we're going to be rich this is the perfect test blah 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 <laughs> right. and, and it and it didn't match real life and so we tried to get you know, Option Omega is largely that. It's us trying to figure out for our own benefit more real life. But what we've realized through time is that there's a there's a nuance to that that I think you get, and I think you try to even what you're saying you want to do is that is there's a there's there's a fine line between like getting it as accurate as possible and understanding that this is an idea a back test is an idea more than a trade. And that's big to me. Like it's it's not a tr- trade; it's an idea. And an idea is malleable. You can test it. You should definitely refine it to get it the best you can. But it's all it's always something based on does this idea work to me? That's that's been the best trades I've seen. It's the best uh, results I've seen people use use it for. It's it's when people get really really intricate and require a strategy that is very, very fragile in my mind, that's where you get into trouble with backtesting. Actually, I was, uh, there was something I've been meaning, and, and I'm gonna explain this in the upcoming episode, but I'll throw this out there and, and get your take on it. Sure. And I think it's kind of runs against some of the conventional wisdom a bit, which is when people talk about backtesting, yes, you want to match real life results. So sometimes people will set up a test to try and match real life. Like they'll have a small account, and they'll do like the exact contract size or whatever. And then be like, okay, this is how much you're going to trade. So I want to set the test up this way. The issue is over a long term, you know, that setup with that one contract for that $10,000 account might actually kind of represent like a, a trade that's very big. Now, if you're doing a long term test and the co- account is compounding and you're doing a fixed contract, the size of the trade starts relative to the account becoming smaller and smaller, right? And that's just one example. It, it, it can go any which way. But my point is when you set up a trade in, in a way, it can compound these kind of inaccurate parameters. The compounding effect will basically throw a lot of dispersion to your result over like a 10 year test, where by the end of that trade, you can't even be confident that it's the same trade almost, right? Yes. So what my thinking is, is set up the trade in the test to be as close to as possible to kind of the theoretical construct. And I'll give one example. Rather than doing a $10,000 account, I like to say do a $10 million account and do a very precise allocation size for the buying power. What that's going to do is that's going to give the test that granularity to size very evenly, okay? 
to get the true, like, okay, let's say this strategy is a, a 20K or 15K or whatever it is. Now, I know people are gonna say, okay, well, I'm not, obviously I don't have a $10 million account. I'm not training these contract sizes, but the point is to get the test to be as pure as possible to match the math. And then afterwards, that's just to validate that the idea and the edge is an edge. And in practice, you figure out a way to get the trade as close to possible. So like if, if I'm trying to allocate 10% and then, you know, based on your actual account size, you can only trade certain contract sizes. And, and it, yes, you can't trade a fractional contract. So you might have to trade a little too large or a little too small. But again, because the, on the day to day, you can put in the effort to try and match your trading to the theory. You don't want to base your trading on inaccurate theory. So I want to, my argument is make the test a tool to build the theory and then get your trading to try and match that as best you can. Does that make sense? Like that, I kind of like spun it on his head and that's something I've been wanting to kind of get out there. That's kind of my, one of my messages. No, that makes sense to me. I mean, in some ways it's the inverse of everything I just said, but strangely enough, I agree with you. I mean, I think that's, that's part of the, uh, the deal of it is especially for, for what you're doing and particularly for, I think there is a difference in premium selling in general and how you have to set up your test. I actually think with premium selling, you actually have to make your test much more precise to get it to, to your point, to get it as close as you can to what a theoretical real life thing that you would do is. And you're right. It might be dependent on the strategy to some degree. That that's certainly yeah, and I think yeah. I think I think there is a little bit of that because yeah, if someone's testing like long strangles, that's almost just a separate, like a completely separate. And to your point, it might be very precise as well, but the the degree to what type of preciseness is the thing that I think you have to figure out through time. And so yeah, I, I agree with that premise. I mean, I think I think looking at it, you know, we have a couple. There's like a caveat of things that we'll go through with people. So we'll say like. Test it with allocation, test it without allocation. You know, test it with one contract, test it with 10 ca contracts. Because al I've always said allocation itself is its own strategy, right? I mean, yes. the difference the difference between time of a 1% allocation and a 10% allocation is huge. And well, has like a lot I said, uh, sizing is a mechanic. That's one. That's right. One way that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, no, I agree with that. No, I look forward, I look forward to that podcast i think that's going to be useful for us to, even as we talk about it with people um i know i don't want to keep you forever because i know you're a busy man does anyone have any questions for david as we start winding down a little bit you can put it in the chat and david there's a i didn't show you this but the humans channel if you look at the humans channel there's a little button there at the top that says open chat so if see, anybody has wait, questions I, I, see, I see 48 comments already <laughs> Or is that, oh, okay, well, that's from maybe that's not really yeah. okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but does anyone have a question? If not, I'm going to keep going because I got lots of questions. So, um, so you're refining your strategies. You kind of put yourself out there, which is you're very brave in my mind because you stand up for what you think in options, and you get options to the point of like drama in these groups. It's very, very opinionated. So how, yeah. like, on a personal level, have you handled that? Like, have you handled that adversity a little bit? So I've handled it practically by just putting out the data, right? Like, you can't argue with the data. Like, here's the test, here's the trade. I would say, like, on Twitter, there was, like, two of the more outspoken kind of critics or trolls or whatever. One of them actually vanished and apparently his account got deleted. So I don't know if that was related or what, but there was another guy who like, I, I think I got on his bad side because I, I commented on something he posted that was ironically about tasty trade. And I didn't find out till later. He's like a lifelong tasty trade basher. Yeah. <laughs> so I got on his bad side. So he started like hounding me about the data engine and it, it, there's a lot of skepticism about some of the stuff I put out because it's almost like too simple sometimes of like, oh, put on a trade every day, set a stop. That's it. <laughs> you know? yeah. And like, and yeah. oh, you're going to expect to beat the market. Like, it's like so dumb sometimes when it, and I, I get that. Right. 
and and at first one of my arguments was but it works right here's the strategy with no stops here's it with stops and look it's better uh, and, and so because i don't have the finance background i didn't necessarily use the right nomenclature um and i don't know if you had a chance to listen to i put an episode maybe last month with a guy named matt hollerbach who is a his twitter handle is breaking the market uh -huh. super smart guy his blog is really super interesting and he actually had independently followed me he found me on Corey kofstein's podcast flirting with models and he reached out and he was like i don't do options really but like some of the stuff you do really aligns with the stuff he does and he his big focus is on the fact that Everything in life is basically dominated by compound returns. It's not the arithmetic growth, but like geometric growth. Because mm -hmm. certain systems, when they look good in terms of like a one-off, you calculate expectancy. When you take into account, into account compounding and volatility tax, certain systems that have a positive arithmetic expectancy will actually have a negative or flat geometric expectancy once you because you know a percent up is not the same as a percent down right that that idea mm -hmm. and so he finally gave me the words to explain the fact that simply when you sell options it is hugely negatively skewed if you don't have risk management mm -hmm. and stops or just risk management in general lets you basically cut off that massive left tail and if you actually look at the new distribution of outcomes like you will raise the geometric expectancy right because in real life your arithmetic expectancy is the math of a single trade mm -hmm. geometric expectancy is the math of 10,000 trades does that difference make sense no so, 100% in, in real life, geometric expectancy is always going to be lower than arithmetic expectancy because of volatility tax. But by using risk management, you can kind of close that gap and bring your geometric expectancy higher and closer to the arithmetic one. So like that was really profound. So I, I finally got him on the podcast and it was like really, and, and I put out another thread about like using screenshots from one of my back tests. So that was, you know, and, and that was like super long winded, but like, yeah, that, that's the way to, to, to answer the skepticism. It's like, you just got to do my best to put out the data and try to explain it in terms that I, I guess are more acceptable um, sometimes. No, I think that, I think that's a very admirable way to do it. Just show the data. Uh, I think to that point about geometric, I mean, the interesting thing about options and the way they work is you you're taking and i and watching some of those things on twitter like you're taking i understand like the healthy skepticism if someone had a healthy skepticism of uh you know a particular strategy that's fine that's what twitter's for whatever uh but the thing that's interesting about you is i, I pre what i appreciate about it is i think at the end of the day all every, anybody who looks at someone and says well, that's stupid, or this back test isn't real, or or as some people were rudely perhaps saying to you last year, like you're you're a fraud or whatever. Here's the interesting thing about that to me: you run a hedge fund, which is the ultimate, it's the ultimate um, geometric return in some ways. Like if you lose people's money, that is the that is your line. Like so, your answer of like giving data is completely right to me because at the end of the day. You, your return has a consequence, good or bad, directly on your life. Yeah. And so I've never understood it when someone pushes you on that because to run a hedge fund, it, it means that you are, people are, you have an amount of, the amount of judges that you have is much greater than someone who's just spouting stuff on Twitter. So but then I can't, but, but then I can't show performance, you know? And so that's like the ironic thing. Like, I was oh, like, I know. Man, I, I could shut a lot of people up if I just showed them the oh, performance. I, I, I mean, that's, know? that's that, again, that's the thing. It just was ridiculous. To, yeah, skin in the game to the point of Alex Banks. Like, it's literally the definition of skin in the game. Like, you, you run other people's money. And, and I understand, like, it's not like you're necessarily going to jail if you have a bad return or something like that. But there's a real consequence to return. It's different than just 
textbook stuff or like arguing about like what's the best trading strategy or Facebook or something like that. Like you literally have skin in the game for your livelihood on this. So, you know, whether someone agrees or disagrees with the strategy, I think it's important to recognize like, you know, you're you're in it. You're actually doing it on a day to day basis. And so uh, I've just I always want to give you the shout out of that because I think I think you handled those things really well. And I do like that you you like persistently like just keep going to the data which i appreciate over and over again so or i'll just answer like for every every question or skepticism i'll just i'll have an answer like an actual answer like well here's what the data shows or like they'll ask something they'll answer but like i don't know sometimes it just doesn't get through but you know it's yeah. fine there's, there's always going to be somebody right yeah, oh, sure. And the follow-up's always like, well, yeah, but show me the actual thing. And you're like, I run a hedge fund. I can't. And they're like, see? And it's like, good lord. <laughs> like, that's crazy. Um, anyway, but you're the man. Just wanted to say that. Anybody got any other questions uh, before I let David go? We will put all your stuff in the Cigar Lounge because you have a lot of different resources. Yeah, someone already, the tradebusters.com. Um, which sure. I, I'll message I, you whatever the links and stuff later. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, and I, I always want to, uh, I always want to give you a shout out and um, a critique. And your shout out is your your website's the most engineering website I've ever seen in my life, and that's also the critique. But I yeah, get that. <laughs> I keep saying one day I'll be a site, but it seems like that's just going to be further and further from a reality. I don't know. It's just like I'm so used to it, and like. I can just go and add like occasionally I'll add another link or like, you know, I had the, the portfolio tracker I made and or this study or that study. And now like I have some that links to another link to another. And it's I don't know, it just it works. And no, that's it's in some ways it's like endearing at this point because it's like this dude just. Yeah. Wants French <laughs> this is what this dude does. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I I appreciate it. And. uh with that you what you also need to do along with your podcast one day is just talk about excel because you you need to run like a, your own course on just excel because what you're doing in excel is crazy to so me i was actually gonna hand in hand with the back test best practices i do want to do like spreadsheet hacks um mm -hmm. or i call it spreadsheet with the traders i i did make a few short youtube videos but then for various reasons i'd rather not deal with the youtube channel right now so i think what i'm going to do is at the same time when i do the the back testing stuff because some of the back testing stuff is how i hack and build tools to further analyze the data that comes out of optional mega for example so i will have like doing this with the spreadsheet and i'll build like it's almost something like you know go to this to download the spreadsheet for you know episode 100 or whatever it is and it's and it's going to be set up like like an exercise basically like you know when you go to these courses and there's like exercises for each lesson so that's kind of the idea I have. We'll see how, how well that goes. But like, cause in the episodes now, I'll already be like, Hey, you need to go to this site and I'll, I'll, I'll reference specific cells. So people know where to look. So I'm, I'm used to doing that. Um, so I think that might be kind of cool. And like, it'll force people to be hands-on. Uh, if there's anything to be said, it's, I know I'm not making my content necessarily easy to consume, but I just said for one hand, maybe it's endearing for the other hand, it actually kind of shows like who wants to make an effort. Like, yeah. because it's not supposed to be easy you know yeah no 100 percent. yeah you're getting a lot of comments about a your, your website's endearing and then b uh you know we all want to get in on the excel course as as someone who markets i want to market that course for you because i think that's the future so anyway david i appreciate you man you are an awesome dude just shout out to him he was he might have been the first or second for sure um demo we ever gave to option omega because he he talks about back testing and he obviously uses it and what he does and uh you've always been you know a huge friend of option omega so i appreciate what you do and and uh yeah, uh, tell, yeah. tell them why pcr is a metric on the the back test <laughs> oh man oh no i mean like so we when we were when we were going through it we gave a demo and because david's david he just immediately like he's like have you thought about this have you thought about that and one of the things he had was premium capture rate. And we looked at it for like five minutes and we were like, well, that's brilliant. And so that PCR on 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 the dashboard is a direct contribution of, of David to Option Omega. So we should call it the David Sun PCR ratio, but uh, we stole it. So yeah, uh, uh, it's good stuff. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate mean, like, you. Doing... I, I I use it all by myself. So yeah, there there we go. So. That's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you guys. I'll let you go. I hope everyone has a great day, and we will let you guys know next time we have to do a cigar launch. So talk to you soon. And yes, uh, it, it will be it will be recorded. So we'll we'll get that to you guys soon. But have a good day. Thanks, David. Thank you. Bye. Bye.